So he talked about the, the struggles that he's had with IPv6 at, uh, at his company. And I'm going to talk, thank you, about um, what, uh, what some other enterprises have been doing uh, with IPv6 in their companies. This is all based on public information. So I'm not giving away anything that's under, under NDA, but hopefully saving you some time so you don't have to go search for everybody else's experiences. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk about uh, Microsoft and Cisco, um, both of them have done, so I mean, you can say Cisco, that's, that's not an enterprise, that's a, um, that's a vendor. Well, yes, except every company also has an IT department, right? So they also have an enterprise arm. And they, um, both uh, Microsoft and uh, Cisco have been working on deploying IPv6 only networks. So I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, plus, Rabobank and uh, JP Morgan, two multinational financial institutions, uh, have been working on IPv6. And, um, uh, and a, a couple other supplemental slides. And I'm gonna try and get us back on time. Um, so Microsoft started with doing, uh, they started saying, how can we get IPv6 only rolled out? They started with uh, IPv6 only on their guest network. And what they found, uh, the biggest finding was, uh, it was IPv6 only plus NAT64. And the biggest finding was that the guest network is used by guests. It's, it's people, it's clients and it's uh, vendors who are coming in, partners who are coming in to do work with Microsoft in their office. They connect to the guest network, and the first thing they need to do is VPN back to their own home networks. But their VPNs don't support IPv6, and therefore, suddenly they're dead. Um, many cases, they were um, VPNs that, were, that had uh, a manually configured IPv4 address, not a name. So then that static address, therefore, they're not doing a DNS lookup to find their VPN termination point. And so DNS 6.4, NAT 6.4 doesn't work. So they said, all right, well, I guess that's not going to work. We can't do v6 only. So um, they created a, uh, a dedicated v6 only SSID. So the people who were willing and able to do some testing with v6 only could have it there. That um, was really important for their, for their internal app developers to make sure that stuff did work with v6 only. There's a lot of stuff, especially early on. Um, Microsoft, I found that a lot of Microsoft software worked well enough with dual stack, but didn't work at all well when you took away IPv4. So uh, they're trying to make sure that it can support uh, v6 only. That was especially important to them when Apple declared that all apps had to support uh, NAT64, had to work in a v6 only environment, maybe with translation. But so interestingly, when Apple said apps in the App Store have to support IPv6, Microsoft started deploying a v6 only development network. Way to go, and so that's an example of the, the kind of follow-on influences you can have. Um, and yeah, so I talked about, so oh, well, so they were used to using DHCP v6, or they were used to using DHCP when for assigning addresses in their networks, uh, but the Android, of course, doesn't support DHCP v6, so they had to do what I was talking about earlier, where they're logging, uh, they're using uh, router advertisements, letting the devices do Slack, and then logging the, the, the devices in the, in the neighbor table. Uh, there, so this SSID has been deployed now in, what, what did I say, 11 locations. They've got more in progress. They're probably, most of those are done by now since this is uh, four or five months old. Um, and there's a corporate wireless. This was the guest wireless. There's now a, a proof of concept in progress for corporate wireless. So that's pretty cool. That's, um, so that's Microsoft. They've got a little bit more. Um, they did, you know, one of the big findings was that their VPN work was especially important. And when they had somebody from one Microsoft office visiting another one and joining the guest network and VPNing back. That VPN didn't work because their VPNs weren't configured for IPv6. Or, I guess, when somebody's at home on a dual stack network, what I was talking about earlier, trying to VPN back to Microsoft, suddenly their VPN doesn't work. So, Microsoft's, you know, the early thing they had to do was say, we need to uh, enable IPv6 on our VPN. So they did that. Um, that's especially important, as I was talking about with, um, when you're on a, a single stack v6 network or, or something that's using uh, NAT64 or other v4 as a service, you're not possibly gonna be able to write down this URL. It's in the slides. I think you can probably uh, do a search for it. I guess I'm talking about Microsoft. You can do a Bing search and uh, find this spreadsheet. This is uh, transition mechanisms in uh, deployment by various ISPs and, and mobile carriers. It's crowdsourced, so it's only as reliable as, as crowdsourcing is, but the idea is to show 
how many networks are in what progress of uh, deploying v6 only or, or v6 with, with some kind of, of translation. Uh, the, of course, Microsoft is doing a lot. Uh, so I mentioned, that, so that they said they're doing a lot of v4 internally. I mentioned that cloud providers are some of the biggest buyers of IPv4 addresses. One of the first well-known purchases of IPv4 addresses was Microsoft buying networks, was buying, a, I think, a slash nine from Nortel Networks. And that was, uh, you know, that, 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 that was big news at the time, really sort of began moving the market, and that wasn't the only transaction they've done. Um, and I think it's fascinating that when uh, the, the person who presented, the last person I saw present this for Microsoft, actually said out loud, we're starting to wonder how long Microsoft has to support IPv4. That's a big deal. For micro even, they're not saying they're not going to support IPv4, but they're starting to think about what the next steps look like. So Cisco, um, they are dual stack everywhere, entire, inside their entire network, um, and uh, most of their network was done for the World IPv6 launch. And they started with the data center core, worked their way outward, including the management network, that's great. Um, now they're doing pilots with their VPN and their extranet networks. So that's, they're sort of, they're moving along. Um, they've also been doing a V6 only pilot. Famously, they're building 23 in San Jose. Um, another presentation I've seen a few times now. They've got, um, I sort of listed all of the technologies that they point out they had to use. Several of these were things that I kind of had to <laughs> skim through earlier when I was talking about uh, security. So they, they had to use neighbor discovery inspection, uh, RA guard, uh, DHCP v6 guard, things to make sure that, uh, that devices weren't being able to spoof the router advertisements or DHCP v6 responses. Um, and of course, Cisco, so they use EIGRP. Um, so that's, um, you know, they, they've begun doing that rollout. They had, oh, and they've begun doing a, a data center v6 only pilot. Um, that's, uh, right now, I think it's just a proof in concept. Um, they're waiting for final approval to actually roll it into production. And that's pretty interesting, too. You start to think about a v6 only data center. Um, you know, of course, there's a, a couple of examples of that now. Uh, and you st and uh, that's still just the data plane, not the control plane. Um, but, um, and I think that's part of, partly because of some of the gaps that we've talked about today, especially, <laughs> sorry, I'm gonna rag on them a little bit. Gee, because part of the problem is, if you, you know, if you want V6 support in control plane, don't use Cisco devices, right? That's, that's kind of their problem, right? Um, and they've got both kinds of that, all right. Um, they, do a, they did a really nice job in this presentation of describing the issues that they've seen. Um, now, the great part of this is they also describe what they had to do to resolve those issues. So they're, the, the Cisco AnyConnect client, they had client issues on the Mac, no problem, software fix. Um, there was no MIB support for the, the translation function. Um, okay, so they did a request for enhancement, they, uh, uh, then there's a, a draft, that's actually so old, it's gotta be uh, revived by now. Cisco TV issue, uh, had player issues, okay, that was an update. Uh, Jabber client failed to connect. That was resolved as an upgrade. Uh, Cisco Spark, the web endpoints didn't work. That actually still was, was, at least at this writing, not IPv6 enabled. Now I will say, I tried to use Spark a couple of months ago. Most of its functions worked very well over IPv6. There were a couple of things that didn't. One of the things that with, with a commercial account that I found was they give you, they say, okay, your account name is Ritevia for my company. Um, Retevia.webex.com or something. Um, it turns out that when they give you that custom uh, host name, that custom URL, it's, um, it's not IPv6 enabled. So I said, I'm sorry, I can't, my company can't use something that doesn't have IPv6 on it. Away with you. Um, there, so similar uh, kind of issue with Webex that they had uh, uh, synthesis, synthesization uh, errors. Um, that took an upgrade, and then there were a few things where they had IPv4 literals uh, in the software. That they had to do a workaround with static DNS entries because, well, it's static IPv4 literals. So that, that's, a, that's a fundamental problem when you're using literals. Um, obviously, that's not gonna scale, and they need to go back and, and rewrite some code. Most of those things, kind of the point here, I've got another slide on this, but you'll notice that most of the, the problems they had here were solved by just upgrading, you know, upgrading the system. So good for them. 
Uh, same thing I talked about with uh, Microsoft. Android phones don't support DHCP v6, so you have to do Slack, so they're trying to figure out we need to be able to do some kind of analysis on them to deny access if they don't meet our security posture. Um, that sounds like 802.1x or network admission control, and um, still working on that one. That's, that's, that's a problem they, I don't think they figured out. Um, their uh, WAN optimization tool is um, WAAS. Um, it does not support IPv6 yet, so that's obviously it's another Cisco product. It's, it's their problem to, to upgrade. Pixie Booth um, doesn't support IPv6, and this to them was kind of a showstopper on bootstrapping servers. Now, it would be if you're using Pixie Boot to boot up servers, but there is UFI, U-E-F-I, uh, I forget what it stands for, but a replacement for Pixie that does support IPv6. So that ought to simply work, and you know, a new transition there. Uh, their storage area networks, they didn't test IPv6 on those. Uh, they basically said, we don't trust that that's ever gonna work, we're just gonna keep using IPv4 for our storage area networks. It doesn't matter to us because they're, you know, the SAN is a tiny little isolated segment that is only spoken to by the devices accessing the SAN, so it's not really important. If I were running the data center, I might have a slightly different prioritization on that because you still have to track which addresses they are on the SAN and, and you, get, you, know, you have to know in order to do the management of the device, how you're getting there, the, whatever you're, whatever's attaching to it still has to uh, be running dual stack, so there's a little bit more of a nuisance there, but um, that's not a crazy you know, they said it's gonna, it, it would cost a lot to be very painful to, to change that. Okay, that's, that's a, not an unreasonable decision for them to make. And you can make your own decision about what's important to you. Rabobank. Um, so Rabobank is, is a bank based in the Netherlands. Um, and they had a security engineer, they asked us, one of their senior network engineers, do we need IPv6? And he said, IPv6? No, we don't need IPv6, we have plenty of IPv4 addresses. And then he said, oh, all right, let me be thorough about this. Do we need IPv6? Well, okay, why would we need IPv6? Are there any uh, websites that we need to reach that are currently low in IPv4 addresses? Like, is there any, is there any, gonna be any, um, are, are, is there any danger that we're gonna have to reach websites that don't have IPv4 in some time in the future? All right, um, customers are on networks that are moving to v6 only. We've seen some networks that are v6 only. What's their experience gonna be like? If they have to go through translation, does that change the customer experience? Right now, the answer is generally no. Is that gonna remain the same forever? Maybe. And then they sort of kind of keep going. Uh, I didn't include all, I'm gonna go back. Um, then they kind of keep going through the process. Okay, so at what point do we need, will we need to access some content or some tool that's only available over IPv6. And they kind of, he kind of went around the, the, part of the, the company and said, when do you think we'll need something that's only available over IPv6? And some people said, oh, not for like five years or six years or 10 years. And he said, great, okay, if we don't need it for 10 years, how long, or seven years I think is what, what the, the consensus was. If we don't need it for seven years, how long is it gonna take us to deploy IPv6 throughout our entire network? And the network engineer said, well, we're a bank, we're gonna be very, very slow and very, you know, do things very carefully and gradually. It's probably gonna take us 10 years. <laughs> so yes, my advice to anybody who's thinking about deploying IPv6 is start three years ago. That's really your best bet. Um, and then he, he also did talk to his fraud department and um, some of his uh, internal forensics teams and say, so what happens when users come to us from a network that only has IPv6 and is doing some kind of address sharing, whether it's you know, NAT44 or NAT64 or XLAT or, or MAPT or whatever, what happens when somebody comes to us over an address sharing technology and we've got a dozen users or a, a thousand users sharing an IPv4 address? And they said that's kind of a disaster for us. Really hard to troubleshoot when one customer is reporting a problem and 10 customers or 50 customers are using the same IPv4 address. Really hard to do fraud reporting when we get an address report saying there's something wrong from this address and we don't know which customer it is. It's really hard to report a crime to the law enforcement agency when all we have is an IPv4 address. We're hoping that we can do address plus timestamp plus, uh, uh, plus port and that the ISP will have that, but uh, maybe they will and maybe they won't. 
And if you haven't done it, it's actually a real nuisance to enable logging of, on a web server of uh, port and timestamp. So, um, uh, oh, I guess I did uh, start talking about some of this. Um, anything greater than 15% of their customers behind that is unacceptable. Um, and you know, how soon? Five to ten years? How long is deploy? Ten years? There's the problem. Um, they also, he also did ask the question. When there's something that we really want that's over only available or IPv6, how much warning will we have? Maybe six months? That's, you know, okay, something's coming up that will only be available over IPv6, and we're going to want it in six months. Okay, if you only get six months warning, but it's going to take you 10 years to deploy, you're, that's, the, the timing's not going to work, you need to start your migration. Um, so far, again, being a bank, very slow, gradual rollout. They're working on it, but they don't have a lot of experience to report yet. Uh, can I ask a question about that? Did they Certainly. did they ask themselves last time we heard about a service that we suddenly decided we wanted, and that was I guess at the time available over IPv4? How much warning did they get that they wanted it? Well, so the, I, I, I suspect <clears throat> that the answer is they heard about a service, and you know I don't think they asked, asked that question quite that way. Right. My my guess would be the answer is we learned about something, and it took us six months to decide that we wanted it. Right, so, so what I'm trying to ask is, I suspect that the services that they don't know that they want yet, that they, that wasn't a good question that they, for them to ask them, they haven't even thought about, they don't, they might not exist yet. Right. And um, the, the, the or, or they, no one's thought that a bank would want them. Right. Right. Absolutely. And so I think that's really the surprising, that'll, they'll be surprised anyway. Well, yeah, that's like, exactly. This is a we know there's stuff we don't know. What happens if if, if something if, if something happens that we're not ready for? That's, I, that's, I, I think it's. That's, I think it's really cool that they realized they didn't know. That was exactly. so cool to know that. Exactly, and I and that's why I bring this. That's why that's why I think it's worth asking that question. That's why I mentioned the question. Is I think everybody ought to be asking themselves that question. Uh, oh, J.P. Morgan. Um, really has told us nothing about their v6 deployment in public, except they spoke at the UK uh, IPv6 uh, council, um, and, but, and talked in very general terms about things that Cisco is doing with IPv6. So I infer that they are, start, that they are thinking about IPv6 and are just not ready to report their, their experiences. So if you happen to know somebody who's working at a financial institution, and needs to know that there are competitors working on IPv6. Well, so Rabobank and JP Morgan are at least talking about IPv6 out loud. Uh, this survey, I don't remember whether this came from uh, Afrinic or from the UK V6 Council. Um, don't worry, of course you can't read this, it's way too small. But they asked what are the biggest barriers to adopting IPv6, deploying IPv6, and they color coded based on the common themes that came out. I thought it was a cool way to, to represent this, to, to catalog it. And here's the summary. Um, and this probably won't surprise you because this is probably what you've encountered yourself, that the biggest barrier that, that people perceive they have is a lack of training or, or a lack of knowledge. Um, Nalini's mentions that we're gonna try and work on improving the, the, the training that's available, making more training available. But I also have to say, if you haven't done it, actually most people in the room have already uh, done something with IPv6, we, we, we did that earlier. If you haven't, actually, I kinda wanna look to you guys. Um, so when you started working on IPv6, how many people would say it wasn't as hard as I expected it to be? That's a show of hands. I see like five, okay, wait, more hands are going up. Okay, let me, so I'm gonna ask the question again, because I really, because I think this is really, <laughs> would be really informative. You went in when you started to learn about IPv6 with some expectation of how much work it was going to be. Was you, so in, in your experience, as you were learning about IPv6, um, for how many people was it less work to learn about IPv6 than you expected it to be? Do that again? It was easier than you expected. Okay, that's uh, 15 people or so. For how many people it was, it was harder than you expected it to be? That's about even, actually, okay. Thank you, that, 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 that was useful to me. So all right, more training um, and, and spreading the knowledge. The next biggest barrier was, was cost. That, that one always surprises me because most of the time there's no hardware cost. Um, 
maybe if you have something, if you have a, a you know a WAN optimization appliance or something that doesn't support V6, you might have to replace it. Generally, it's been, it's it's software. It's hours of I'm seeing lots of people nodding. Yeah, um, it's you've got configurations to build and you've got uh, software to rewrite. Really, you want to jump in? Yeah, sorry, couldn't resist. Can't <laughs> reach that thing. So, um, you know, the cost is not. Thank, thank you, Drew. The cost is not um, hardware or software. It's it's redoing everything, instruction it's manuals. Labor. I mean, it's yeah. it's people work, you know, and or like you know your help yeah. desk, and they're like, what is that, you know? Right. Yeah. So yeah. So and that, and that that also includes teaching people about what they you know teaching your help desk what they need to know about IPv6. But yeah, it's the labor cost. It's yeah. almost entirely it's at least ninety percent labor cost. Um, and so whenever anybody asks me how much does V6 how much does it, does it cost to deploy V6? How cheap are your people? That's really kind of, you know. Um, equal with cost was lack of prioritization. And I think Mike made that very clear when he was talking about it earlier, that um, there's a strong perception that there is no priority. Now, I'm, I try very, very hard when I talk to a company uh, or somebody from a company about IPv6 not to set their priorities for them because I don't know what else you're working on. So. Your priority is your priority. Um, in some cases, there's a, a technology or vendor that uh, doesn't support V6, and not too much we can do about that except beat up on our vendors. We're all pretty good at that. Yeah, Mike. I want to know why this mic is so low. <laughs> <laughs> that mic is pretty high. <laughs> well, yeah, it's what I had for lunch. Um, no, this is fine, Drew. Oh, thank you. Um, do you, can you say the source of this? And the reason I'm going to ask is, Nalini's point was great, what you were saying is great about the cost. I'd love to know when people respond to this and say it's cost, if they can say whether it is hardware, software. Because the biggest cost for us will be to do a project. Yeah. Yeah, that costs money. We got to get a project manager. You got to get people's time, blah, 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 blah. And that's a huge barrier. So that's how I would have answered it. But cost can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. and be Need to know what the category it falls in, or subcategory. I haven't encountered anybody who said that the hardware replacement cost was their biggest barrier. Um, the hardware replacement costs tend to be things like, okay, so you may have, again, okay, you may have one or two appliances out of your entire network that do need to be replaced. It tends to be things like the the edge equipment, like like uh, cable modems or DSL modems or home routers or consumer electronics. Um, maybe it's handsets, but that's a two-year replacement cycle. You know, I don't know if it's and I agree my percept with yeah. you that my perception would be that would be somewhat minimal. I'm going to sneak in another question. Sure. Um, during, I think it was Robobank, but there was a, an estimate of 10 years to do the deployment, and that scared the heck out of me. I couldn't stand up fast enough to ask the question. Um, is that common? Because I've been estimating two to three years, and I'm, maybe I'm looking for what a realistic figure is based on anybody's experience. And Rabobank has had some experience. So yeah. My experience was five or six years. Ellie wants to answer, too. My experience was five or six years, mm -hmm. but that was when we were the, one of the first large-scale V6 deployments. We had a lot of bugs that we had to get fixed. Those bugs have now been fixed. So I am hearing more like two or three years for, for most people. Okay. Thank you. The 10 scared me. Yeah, they're just conservative. Mike, so uh, just out of curiosity, how many people in the room uh, started out programming? Like, did you? Okay, how many people in the room learned COBOL? <laughs> okay, a, ha a handful of people learned COBOL. It's still out there. Yep. Okay, IPv4 will be out there <laughs> even longer. And uh, so, again, the, the banks have systems that run COBOL, All right? So. You should expect that, you know, at the very, at the very least, there'll be pockets of IPv4 for a yes. long time, yep. and it, it takes, I would say, uh, a minimum of a year to do the sort of change in a network, even in a small corner of a network, to handle something like IPv6. Yep. I, I agree. There will be at least pockets of IPv4 for a very long time. There are pockets of SNA in bank networks in particular. <laughs> so yes. Why is this thing so high? <laughs> um, you know, I wanted to kind of say one of the things, and we had another panel, so um, 
Uh, one of the things we're doing with the training and stuff, we're kind of telling people, you know what, we're going to make you a deal. We're going to get you a bunch of free training. Lee and I are going to, that Lee and I charge for usually, but you're going to get it for free. But you got to make a deal in return. We want you to IPv6 enable your web server. That's all we're asking, your external facing web server. And of course, we're not going to be like, if you don't do it, you know, we'll, we'll come take the training out of your head or something. But you know, but I mean, I think it's, because I think there's a whole different thing to doing your internal network. I mean, that's just, that they're not, people are just not ready to go there. But your web server, just do that. And, but that's probably a six month task. But anyway, so, so Lee, sorry. I'm watching Nalini count down the seconds on my timer here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. So um, I'm gonna do real quick some of the findings, that, um, summary, the dual stack management is kind of a pain in the neck. Um, and you, you, the, ultimately, you really do wanna get towards IPv6 only so you can simplify your network management. Um, you need to get your executives to buy in and you need to get somebody asking about IPv6 on every single project. Uh, that's some of the common theme we heard. Uh, test beds, get some early wins so you build some momentum. Um, people like to have some paperwork, some you know, position papers or project guides or, or coding documents, architecture documents describing how to do v6 or describing that you must do v6. Keep going. Everybody says perseverance is the biggest thing. Um, one of the biggest lessons learned that I have found from uh, everybody I've talked to who has deployed v6 is that whatever organizational problems you have get revealed as you start to deploy IPv6 because you have to have communication because you, you know, you're trying to communicate between systems. And there we go. I'm sorry, I took, I didn't get you quite back on track. Thank you very much.